And what I hope will tie together these two very different subjects is psychoactive plants. Some of you may already already seen my DVD video that I made on this topic. It was, uh, it accompanied the, a recent issue of the journal Altrove, which is published by the Italian Society for the Study of States of Consciousness. It was at their meeting in 2004 that I first presented my research on this subject. The original lecture, as well as the DVD program, presented an introductory view of this provocative topic and only a brief overview of the evidence I've collected that supports my claim. So today, rather than repeating the same presentation, and in consideration of the spirit of the symposium, I'd like to go into somewhat more detail about one aspect of the evidence I've collected for my hypothesis. The so-called Garden of Eden hypothesis that cognitively modern humans appeared only quite recently and almost overnight. And my addition to it, that humankind's sudden genesis was due to a unique situation involving the use of psychoactive plants, has led me to a new and unusual theory about how psychedelic drugs produce their effects on consciousness. To begin then, I'll just briefly review the territory presented in the DVD program for the benefit of those who have not seen the video and as a perhaps useful summary of the main points for those who have seen it. Now, first on the list of evidence for the evolutionary hypothesis is the pan-global use of psychoactive plants by almost every tribe and ancient society we have information about. The use of consciousness-altering substances appears to be the rule rather than the exception, in every corner of the earth where man has developed. Now, if psychoactive plant use by early man was as widespread as the evidence indicates, then it would be hard to maintain that such use suddenly came into being independently in all the far reaches of the globe where modern man has settled. For that to have happened, one would have to posit a strong instinctive drive in our species to search out and use consciousness-altering substances. Now, in fact, that may well be the case. But if so, then, as with psychoactive use, the instinct would not suddenly have appeared either, but must have been with us all along. It is much more logical to conclude that the use of psychoactives must go right back to the place of human origins in East Africa, in a moment, I'll show you an overview of the current paleoanthropological evidence that places the sudden genesis of cognitively, cognitively modern humans in East Africa about 50 or 150,000 years ago. But for the moment, I'll just ask you to accept this new and revolutionary scenario that has only recently come to light due to studies of human genetics. Tying in with use by early man, a recent book by Giorgio Samarini documents the astonishingly widespread use of psychoactive plants in the animal kingdom. Together with other cited authorities, Samarini concludes that the search for altered consciousness and the drugs that produce it is a primary motivational force in the behavior of animals, both primitive and advanced. And the best evidence indicates that it is a human universal as well. So essentially, we have pan-global use by early man and similarly widespread use by animals. So it would stretch credibility to maintain that for just the period when hominids evolved into cognitively modern humans, no psychoactives were part of the picture. Or that our instinctive tendency to find and use substances to alter consciousness was curiously suspended during the period of our sudden graduation from apehood. Psychoactive plants and preparations appear to be a permanent part of the picture, no matter where we look in time or location. And so the question arises, what actual role did psychedelic use play in the emergence of modern humans? And secondly, was that role merely incidental, accompanying and perhaps assisting our proto-human ancestors in a process that was happening anyway? 
or might psychedelic use have been a necessary and essential catalyst to his emergence, an emergence that would not have otherwise happened. My researchers have indicated that is the second of these scenarios that is the most likely. The evidence I've collected appears to show that the use of consciousness altering substances provided the necessary means to bridge an otherwise impenetrable evolutionary barrier separating us from our proto-human ancestors. Now let's take a brief look at the recent discoveries in paleoanthropology and genetics, which have provided a revolutionary new timeline for the emergence of cognitively and behaviorally modern humans. For most of the 20th century, the so-called multi-regional hypothesis has dominated scientific thought on human origins. The multi-regional hypothesis posits that there was an early migration by modern man's predecessor, Homo erectus, from the African heartland to the Near East, Europe, and Asia, occurring between one and two million years ago. Secondly, the multi-regional hypothesis proposes that this migration was followed by a long period of regional and parallel development, with some intermixing between regional populations to produce Homo sapiens quasi-independently in the various regions. In the early 1970s, however, Chris Stringer proposed a new and radically different scenario for the emergence of modern humans, a proposal which has come to be called the Out of Africa II hypothesis. Dr. Stringer writes in his recent book, African Ex Exodus, for the past few years, a small group of scientists has been accumulating evidence that has revolutionized our awareness of ourselves and our animal origins. They have shown that we belong to a young species which rose like a phoenix from a crisis which threatened its very survival and then conquered the world in a few millennia. Briefly, this, this scenario, the Out of Africa II hypothesis, posits a second African migration shown here by the blue arrows occurring much more recently than the first migrations of Homo erectus. These more recent migrating beings, however, were not Homo erectus, but fully modern humans resulting from the evolution of Homo erectus within the East African region itself. The Out of Africa II hypothesis claims that the first ancestors of the entire human race migrated from their African homeland and slowly but surely replaced the still existent remnants of Homo erectus populations throughout the Eurasian continent. For several years, the Out of Africa II hypothesis remained an obscure idea shunned by mainstream paleoanthropology, but in the early 1990s, new techniques in the field of genetics suddenly paved the way for widespread recognition of Chris Stringer's theory. Mitochondrial DNA and later Y-chromosome nuclear DNA analysis of modern humans from all walks of life showed convincingly that the unique common ancestors of the entire human race were few in number and had lived a mere 50 to 150,000 years ago. Chris Stringer and other workers have come to the conclusion that there must have been some kind of unusual event, some catalyst some kind of trigger which set in motion the very rapid rise of human culture from a mere handful of individuals and a, few, a, a mere few moments ago on the evolutionary scale. Chris Stringer writes in his book, it was one of the critical events in mankind's convoluted route to evolutionary success. The nature of the trigger of this great social upheaval is still hotly debated but remains a mystery at the heart of our progress as a species. Was it a biological, mental, or social event that sent our species rushing pell-mell towards world domination? Reading these paragraphs in African Exodus soon after its publication in, I believe, 1993, I realized I had been set for several years working on ideas which might provide the answers sought by this recent revolution in thinking about human origins. It was a falling into place of pieces of a puzzle which justified the arms, armchair speculation I had been entertaining for years. The question that Chris, Chris Stringer was asking seemed to be answered decisively by my proposal that the influence of 
Psychoactive drugs was the catalyst, the social and mental event that ignited human consciousness. Other noted paleoanthropologists have since concurred with Stringer's view with slightly different interpretations of the data and slightly different resulting hypothesis. Spencer Wells, in his book, The Journey of Man, speculates that a single fortuitous event may well have changed the course of human evolution. Richard Klein, likewise, has been a strong supporter of the so-called Great Leap Forward, or Big Bang of Human Consciousness theory, and believes that a single fortuitous genetic mutation might have sufficiently changed the way our brains are wired to provide the necessary catalyst. As speculative as the causes proposed by various researchers are, there is a near certainty about the great leap forward itself. Whatever the cause might have been, quite suddenly, almost instantaneously in evolutionary time, archaic or proto-man became modern man. He became as a god with creative powers denied to mere animals. He was banished from the Garden of Eden and began his migrations to the four corners of creation. It is almost as if the creation myth of the book of Genesis were literal historical fact. So far, however, and despite my continuing efforts, paleoanthropologists have overlooked the distinct possibility that, that rather than a catalyst being a change in genes or neural circuitry, it might have been something that Adam and Eve ate for breakfast. There remain many detractors of the new evolutionary scenario, of course. Scientists long committed to an established paradigm, as was so brilliantly chronicled by the historian of science, Thomas Kuhn, very rarely change their position to adopt the new viewpoint. So multi-regionalism and rejection of the new genetic evidence remains commonly heard. And concerning the catalyst I have suggested, mainstream science and the general public as well long oppressed with confused and drug war propaganda, snicker at the idea that drug use might be anything but escapism, a manifestation of primitive delusion or inability to cope with modern times. To suggest that the rediscovery of psychedelics is the most important finding of the entire 20th century and that the use of these substances has been one of the defining characteristics of being human invites attitudes not seen since the Spanish Inquisition. Of course, I would be the first to admit that we have no direct evidence whatsoever that our proto-human ancestors used psychoactive plants. What we need, therefore, is evidence from several perspectives, which is mutually reinforcing. Although each viewpoint might it's itself be considered merely a dubious guess, perhaps the most persuasive evidence I have uncovered involves the cognitive and neurocognitive mechanisms of the action of psychedelic drugs. When combined with other speculative evidence, such as the new evolutionary and genetic findings, the picture begins to command some respect. Early psychedelic researchers, in response to the rather bewildering range of what happened during psychedelic experiences, had compiled long lists of the supposed effects of psychedelic drugs. Other researchers had proposed that the effects of psychedelics were more the result of set and setting than of drug use, per se. This seemed to be a useful model as far as it went, but really it didn't go very far in my opinion. It seemed to me that something important was being missed, that what psychedelic drugs actually did must be something quite simple, both neurologically and cognitively. Yet that simple change in cognitive functioning be capable of catalyzing a cascade of all the possible, but not always experienced, secondary effects noted by researchers. It was only at this secondary stage that set and setting would come into play, thus preserving this seemingly sensible idea that the drug itself had a definite, discoverable, and reasonable, reasonably simple initial effect. The challenge was to find out what that initial cognitive effect might be. Guided by the maxim that first impressions may provide important clues to a phenomenon, I went back to basics and read, for the nth time, Huxley's Doors of Perception and his description of his first psychedelic experience with mescaline. One passage of three or four pages suddenly took on a significance I hadn't noticed before. And please note the word I have used here, significance. I won't have time to read you the whole passage as, pre as presented in my DVD, but 
Here are the relevant highlights. Huxley writes, I took my pill at 11. An hour and a half later, I was sitting in my study looking intently at a small glass vase. I was seeing a bunch of flowers shining with their own inner light and all but quivering under the pressure of the significance with which they were charged. And the books, for example, with which my study walls were lined, like the flowers, they glowed when I looked at them with brighter colors, a profounder significance. In the mescaline experience, the mind does its perceiving in terms of intensity of existence, profundity of significance, relationships within a pattern. But as I looked, the view gave place to what I can only describe as the sacramental vision of reality. I was back where I had been when I was looking at the flowers, back in a world where everything shone with the inner light and was infinite in its significance. I suddenly felt I had stumbled on a very big secret that Huxley himself had revealed in his writing but seemed not to have noticed. His description of his experience seemed to show that all the characteristics of his altered conscious state flowed from an initial perceived heightened significance of everything he observed. Note how often he refers to significance in the quotation I've just read you. In a flash, in a flash of inspiration, I suspected that this was, in fact, the initial cognitive effect of psychedelics, to radically augment the auto detection of significance. But was it possible to show a brain system that might be the center of this cognitive operation? With the aid of a few books on neuroscience and cognitive science, I was able to assemble a new view about the effect of psychedelic drugs, a view that proposes that the initial cognitive effect and the initial psychological effect of psychedelics is to radically augment the perception of significance or salience in the experienced sensory fields as well as in the stream of one's internal conscious thinking. Now the brain of essentially every animal, both modern and primitive, contains a small blue node on the brain stem called the locus coeruleus. The locus coeruleus is densely connected to essentially all areas of the brain and the body as well. And it is a feature of animal brains so universal among species that it can be confidently said that it must have, been, must have evolved very early on and be involved with some very fundamental and important brain system associated with an equally important cognitive operation. In this illustration, we see the great wealth of nerve fibers of the locus coeruleus projecting to higher brain areas, as well as down the spinal column to the body. The neurons of the locus coeruleus utilize the neurotransmitter norepinephrine, which is released at the end terminals of these nerve fibers present in essentially every area of the brain, as the illustration shows. In my reading, I quickly uncovered research that showed, for example, that in lab animals, the locus coeruleus was very highly activated under certain conditions that it seemed at first to be diverse and contradictory. If the animal was suddenly presented with its favorite food, locus coeruleus activity spiked. Yet if the animal was suddenly threatened with its worst enemy, the locus coeruleus, locus coeruleus exact, uh, acted exactly the same way. Researchers had concluded that locus coeruleus and its system of connections reacted to an amazingly wide variety of stimuli. But it seemed to me that what was ha really happening was that the locus coeruleus was actually the center of a brain system whose cognitive function was the auto detection of significance, or to use the current term from cognitive neuroscience, the auto detection of salience. When I say auto, auto detection of salience, I mean that the process occurs without conscious deliberation, and even takes over and dominates other conscious processes. Our attention is unavoidably drawn to the salient event without the least conscious calculation. I think it's obvious how important such a cognitive function and its supporting brain system should be, and that we can therefore posit that evolutionary pressure to develop such a system would have been great for animals able to rapidly and automatically detect the most salient feature of their surroundings based on the entirety of previous experience would have enormous advantage over an animal lacking such an ability. Having started with my premise that the initial cognitive effect leading to the entire range of psychedelic experience was the radical increase in the perception of salience in the perceptive field, 
The idea that the locus coeruleus system was the brain device that provided the auto detection of salience seemed so obvious, I wondered why neuroscientists had so far only thought that this brain system was merely reacting to salience rather than actively detecting it. I decided to ask Jack Panksepp, the author of Effective Neuroscience, in which I had already found several passages which supported my theory. Professor Panksepp was most kind and wrote me that your hypothesis very much in the right direction. Indeed, I suspect it is implicitly in the minds of most neuroscientists. It has long been known that the LC, the locus cruelius, sets up attentional processes in the cortex, and that there are many sensory and emotional inputs that could achieve this. Lots of neuropeptides feed into the LC, so it is not really not necessary to make it the first and only link in the salience cascade, but certainly a prominent one. In short, I see no problem with this hypothesis, and in a sense, it is implicit in the neuro neurophysiological finding that LC and E increases signal-to-noise levels throughout the sensory cortices. Now, the locus coeruleus is densely connected to essentially all areas of the brain via norepinephrine, or NE, neurons. And at first, this seemed to be a, a problem, as the target of most psychedelic drugs seemed to be not the norepinephrine neurons and receptors, but the serotonin system, whose neurons originate in the RAF nuclei. Here we see the serotonin-containing neurons of the RAF nuclei in brown and their nerve connections to the rest of the brain. We see that the serotonin system, like the norepinephrine system of the locus coeruleus, is an important and widely influ influential brain system. But it didn't take long with a good book on brain connections to discover that the locus coeruleus appears to be controlled by the RAF nuclei via serotonin neurons, much as the RAF nuclei perform a wide variety of other control functions in the body and brain. Here we see a close-up showing the connection from the dorsal and medial RAF nuclei in brown to the locus coeruleus in blue. Indeed, scientists had already in 1978 provided much evidence for the control of the locus coeruleus by the serotonin system, but researchers of psychedelic drugs had apparently overlooked the importance of the finding along with the importance of the distinction between the locus coeruleus merely reacting to rather than actively detecting salience. Reading further, I found that some neuroscientists and cognitive science had already noted that the locus coeruleus seemed to be some kind of detector of salience. Indeed, the noted researcher G.K. Agajanian had stated in an article in 50 Years of LSD that the locus coeruleus had been likened to a novelty detector. But it seemed to me that the potential importance of such a cognitive function as salience detection had not been adequately considered by researchers, nor had anyone thought through how the locus coeruleus system might provide such a cognitive function. Nor had anyone so far shown that the control of the NE system by the serotonin system might provide a model of how psychedelics worked that adhered to the perception that the major content of psychedelic experience was indirectly caused, a mechanism that agreed with the psychological and even religious principles that the psychedelic effect was one of catalytic action, activating a kind of awareness that humans were inherently capable of in a variety of situations, such as meditation, fasting, or other practices, or even these states do occur totally spontaneously. Agajanian even proposed that it might be the serotonin afferents to the locus coeruleus which controlled it and were responsible for the fact that LSD, mescaline, and other psychedelics all facilitated the activation of locus coeruleus neurons by sen sensory stimuli. What remained to be recognized was the importance of salience detection as a primary cognitive function and that it could, in fact, be the initial effect of psychedelic consciousness. Now, it is not only through the direct connection of the locus coeruleus that the serotonin system would control the gain or the intensity of salience detection. For psychedelic drugs act on a great many types of serotonin receptors, some of which are located not on the serotonin neurons, but on the receiving end of various other efferent neurons throughout higher brain areas. 
I discovered several important clues to how the norepinephrine and serotonin systems cooperated in the higher brain areas from the current definitive text on cognitive neuroscience edited by Michael Gazaniga. In chapter 44, a particularly interesting article by Robbins and Everett, I found much further support for the idea that the serotonin system controlled the gain or intensity of operation of the NE system of the locus coeruleus. Freely interpreting much of their evidence, including the opening statement that unitary concepts of arousal have outlived their usefulness, the entire collection of articles in the section of the book on arousal and attention could be reinterpreted to show that these behavioral phenomena of arousal, attention, and orienting to stimuli, long thought to be primary cognitive operations, were actually secondary observables that arose from and were based on the as yet unrecognized primary cognitive function of salience detection. The more I read, the more it seemed that here might be a major discovery one that had been right under our noses for years and that it had become evident only through the possibility to ke chemically augment the cognitive operation of salience detection through the use of psych psychedelic drugs. It may well turn out that psychedelic research has provided the key to show that salience detection might in fact be one of the most important underlying operations of cognition as yet undiscovered due to its transparency under conditions of normal consciousness. <clears throat> At first I had suspected that perhaps salience detection could be thought of as another of the emotions, for its production and perception seem to have much in common with, for example, the emotion of fear. Salience detection would possibly be an unemotional emotion. But further considerations have led me to conclude that salience detection is even more fundamental than the emotions. For salience detection must itself depend on the incorporation of emotional values or valences associated with remembered and even unremembered events. To sum, up must, to sum up what must certainly be an oversimplified view, but perhaps one that might provide a useful departure point for new research, I propose that under the influence of psychedelics, at their target serotonin receptors, the RAF nuclei, and whose controlling center is the locus coeruleus, turn up the gain on the salience detection system, and thus the psychedelic voyager be like Huxley, who saw a world where everything shone with the inner light and was infinite in its significance. If any of you should subsequently have the opportunity to meditate on this theory during a psychedelic experience, produced by meditation, of course, as I have, I believe that you might become quite open to the idea that a radically increased perception of salience in everything you perceive, including your own internal train of thoughts, may well be the solution to the long explored question of how psychedelics work. The theory has the favorable attributes of being amazingly simple and parsimonious, its aspects quite observable, and based on and agreeing with a wide range of already amassed cognitive and psychological research. Of course, the various psychedelic drugs all have their particular spectrum of noise and side effects, especially during the initial phase of their psychological influence. So one must try to ignore noise to see through to the central effect upon which all the rest becomes constructed. Just as a personal observation, I would rate the minor psychedelic cannabis as being one of the most noisy, and the latter phases of the LSD experience the least noisy of these type of altered consciousness states. <clears throat> now I've already shown you how widely the locus coeruleus is connected to essentially all the higher brain areas, but if the locus coeruleus is to act as a detector rather than as a mere relay of information as Agajanian and others have thought, current models of the neurology of the locus coeruleus system must be incomplete. The NE neurons that connect the locus coeruleus to the cortex, here shown in black, all send their action potentials or signals in the ascending direction, implying that the locus coeruleus is providing information upwards. But if this is so, from what information is it detecting anything? 
If it is to, to detect something, it must do so from an input of information, not an output. Such thoughts finally led me to a revision of current ideas about the operation of such brain systems. Reading through my favorite text on brain connections again, I came to the unavoidable conclusion that in at least some brain systems, such as the locus coeruleus NE system, the principal efferent nerve fibers must be acting not so much to send information as to request it. To detect salience, the locus coeruleus must ask the entire range of higher brain functions, such as sensory input, memory, emotional values, to deliver back to it all the information needed to decide what part of current consciousness was salient. Interestingly, the sole cortical projection back to the locus coeruleus, shown here in red, arises from the prefront prefrontal cortex. So it may well be that as the locus coeruleus requests what it needs from higher brain areas, all the relevant information is then assembled and associated towards prefrontal areas to then be supplied to the locus coeruleus as per its request. This scenario agrees in some important aspects with Franz Vollenweider's PET scan experiments, which show that psychedelic experiences involve intense frontal area activity or hyperfrontality. But rather than being a sign of sensory overload, as Vollenweider suggests, the heightened activity may instead be the result of high levels of salience detection. I think, however, that this must still be an incomplete model of what is really happening. What the locus coeruleus appears to do is to define the parameters for the creation of a cognitive, a cognitive informational entity set up using both its efferent and afferent connections. And this informational entity is probably holonomic in nature rather than serially constructed, as would be the analogous informational situation with a computer. Thus, the higher brain areas need not send back to the locus coeruleus the entire quantity of information as if there were, this were a serially organized computer operation. But instead, the entire system is creating a sort of standing wave or holonomic projection of information. If indeed the salience informational entity were holonomic other than and other higher cognitive functions, even consciousness itself, were holonomic, this would explain how they can be experienced in an all-at-once and bound-together operation, as opposed to a serial and time-consuming way. We experience memory or recognize a face in a way that computers only envy. We need simply the essential input, and out comes a memory we have not visited in decades. Or we see a face that is thousands of faces in the past yet we recognize it instantaneously. This cannot be the result of serial processing. If at least some, and why not all, cognitive informational entities are holonomic, the combined or bound together integration of these informational entities could be instantly achieved by superimposition to create overall seamless awareness where perception, salience, emotional valence, and other aspects of consciousness become a unitary experience. The mathematical model for such overlapping holonomic informational entities could be the simple addition or subtraction of the Fourier transform coefficients that such entities might be represented by. For example, it is theoretically possible, but technologically quite difficult, to superimpose the analogous optical holographs to achieve some and some and or difference results. Such a model of brain operation was su actually suggested quite some time ago and elaborated in detail by Carl Prebram in his 1991 book, Brain and Perception. His ideas are worth close consideration by anyone seriously modeling how we humans work. Unfortunately, mainstream neuroscience has largely ignored his work perhaps in response to his interest in psychedelics during the 1960s. He is not alone, as all here should be aware, in being so ignored. And also, unfortunately, as related in a recent paper about Prebrum's theory by Jeff Prido, it seems that most contemporary neurophysiologists seem content just to amass data on neuron signaling and receptor function 
independent from any global theory of the brain and mind, leaving that admittedly far more difficult task to future generations. Research funding appears to be much more easy to obtain when the proposed study is on exploring how drugs affect receptors. For here is the domain from which many new and profitable psychiatric products are developed. Yet, having a global theory about the brain-mind should be far more important than is now recognized, for it helps to have such a theory for framing research questions. With a limited paradigm, only limited results can be expected. The first objection I might meet concerning this theory is it seems unlikely that a mere increase in salience detection could possibly account for all the powerful and sometimes overwhelming aspects of psychedelic experience. Although the locus coeruleus system has long been recognized as tremendously important by neuroscientists due to the widespread omnipresent nerve fibers connecting the locus coeruleus and all other areas of the brain and body, that was often taken as an indication that the locus coeruleus must be involved in a great many things that were as yet a mystery. I would propose that the obvious neurological importance of the system shows the equally important nature of the cognitive function of salience detection. Actually, the term detection doesn't go nearly far enough. We would similarly be using a limited description if we were to call the emotion of fear a process of fear detection. Fear and salience are not objective, out there things to be detected like a color or an odor. They are perceived and interpreted according to many learned and instinctive parameters and one's total experience and memory of fear producing or in this case, salient events. Thus, for psychedelic experience, although such a seemingly simple and reductionist explanation may at first seem insufficient to the task, it may be through recognizing the great importance of salience detection that we can understand how it may well be the initial effect of psychedelic experience. To return to the evolutionary question, if the salience effect is as important as proposed, then it might well be the very kind of sudden catalyst that in the right time and place could awaken proto-man to human awareness. In addition, it would imply that the psychedelic awakening was a necessary and not merely a facilitating influence in a process that was happening anyway. A few further reflections on the topic are merited. For evolutionary reasons and the survival of possessors of a salience auto-detection system, it may be surmised that such a system must be quite reliable, very reliable, well-trained and controlled, and unlikely to give false positives or negatives. The system would not have been of, of much advantage if it made frequent errors since the animal depended on it for its safety and survival. Additionally, again due to considerations of evolutionary pressure to develop the best and most efficient kind of salience detection system, only in very exceptional circumstances would the gain of the system be at a maximum, such as in life and death situations where accurate and totally appropriate action by the animal could save it from destruction. In the case of modern man, it may be surmised that the locus coeruleus salience detection system is far less employed in such dire situations as it was in more dangerous times, or as it might have been in animals under far more frequent threat than even proto-man. Thus, we could expect there to be a large reserve of intensity of reaction in this system, a reserve that is rarely, if ever, needed during a human lifetime. A similar claim, easier, easier for us to accept, perhaps, because of our familiarity with the phenomenon, would be the wide range of intensity of the emotion of fear. Fear is, is like salience detection, an automated reaction to our surroundings and even our conscious thought processes. And for we moderns, as with salience detection, fear is rarely experienced in its highest intensities. Infrequent experience of the maximum intensity of either, of course, does not at all stunt their potential to deliver their full effect when circumstances warrant. The once or twice in a lifetime experience of extreme fear with all its bodily and psychological side effects surely testifies for that claim. In the case of the salience detection system, when its intensity is suddenly jacked up to maximum output 
through the extra-normal means of a psychedelic drug, one would therefore be taken by surprise, so to speak, and the situation would be likely to lead to a cascade of secondary psychological processes, starting with amazement, as in Huxley's narrative, all the way to the possibilities of life-changing religious experience, the perception of the white light, and the oneness of creation. And there would be a self-intensifying feedback cycle involved as well. Remember that I have proposed, at least in the human animal, that the auto-detection of salience occurs not only concerning external stimuli, but also for the internal stream of consciousness and thinking. So as we begin to be aware of unusual and unexpected perceptions of the external, we try to interpret them. We become amazed and mystified. And this state of mind is itself auto-detected by the locus coeruleus system as unusually salient. Proceeding in ever-intensifying cycles, the process takes us to the ultimate destination, whether that be heaven or hell as a choice hidden in the sometimes inaccessible depths of each of our worldviews. This may explain why even a small dose of psychedelic can sometimes lead to a full-blown mystical experience if our set and setting is primed for it. As I said, the salience theory may seem at first to be overly reductionist, wiping away all the mystery and magic from the psychedelic experience, reducing religious ecstasy in the sense of oneness of creation to a mere chemical trick played on a small blue spot on the brain stem. But thinking more completely about the matter should reveal that contrary to theories which try to attribute the entire range of the experience to the drug input itself, the salience theory puts the mystery and miracle right back where it should be, as an in in inherent potential of the immensity of human experience and existence and the complexity and ultimately unfathomable nature of the human mind. By whatever means, none of which can accurately be considered artificial, one need only to nudge open the doors of perception, always ajar to discover the salience of the infinite. As for our proto-human ancestor, who probably experienced a much wider range of salience auto-detection than we moderns, I would remind you that the locus coeruleus system must have been very well trained, so to speak, and not give false positives. Yet, under the influence of psychedelics, that is precisely what it does, and precisely what it did for our Garden of Eden ancestors. Suddenly, like Huxley, and completely out of the blue, they perceived the sacramental vision of reality. They perceived a new and cleansed perception of a world where everything shone with the inner light and was infinite in its significance. Without the sacramental agent to trick the locus coeruleus into performing its sacred and perhaps preordained task, would man have been able to awaken on his own? I think not. This was the first sacrament of which humankind partook, the first supper. Now, there is additional material on my DVD video that I mentioned that I won't have time to revisit today. Further observations on how evolution necessarily produced a very conservative consciousness in proto-humans that was only rarely put to full use also suggests that a consciousness catalyzer must have been the key to our awakening. I also present evidence that the awakening may well have occurred about 74,000 years ago when Mount Toba in Sumatra, Indonesia, let loose with a spectacular volcanic eruption, spewing into the air an amount of material almost 3,000 times that of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State, USA. Apparently in places in England, there are layers of ash a couple of meters thick from this eruption in the Philippines. The eruption would have caused a volcanic winter, the onset of the severest part of the last ice age and radically lowered sea levels and continental precipitation. I also suggest that the probable location of the Garden of Eden was the Abyssinian highlands of Ethiopia, a likely area of retreat for our original ancestors where they might have escaped the drought and starvation the Toba eruption must have produced. It may be no coincidence that some recent and important fossil finds in Ethiopia, just to the east of the Abyssinian Highlands region, are thought to be the earliest fossils yet found of anatomically modern humans. 
They date to 160,000 years ago and may well be the ancestors of a people of the region who, at the insistence of the Toba volcanic eruption and the encroaching ice age, then took refuge in the mountains to the west. Here, our ancestors would have encountered new sources of food and perhaps even Amanita muscaria, that mushroom that has played such an important role in our entire history and prehistory. Normally, Amanita muscaria is a native of high temperate and subarctic regions where it is associated with birch and conifers also native to high latitude, moist regions. But as the depths of an ice age approach, it has been established that such high latitude species have taken refuge further and further south as the ice sheet invaded their former territories. Perhaps, as it was pictured in the famous fresco in, in Plancourot Abbey in France, it actually was Amanita muscaria in the Garden of Eden. Now we have a better idea of when and where that formerly mythical scene might have taken place. Well, so what? What if psychedelics played an important evolutionary role for we humans, even to the extreme case of being a necessary catalyst? Is this only of mere paleoanthropological interest, a mind game for those who thoughts, whose thoughts are of long ago and far away vistas that hardly has relevance for modern civilization? Since I have arrived at the end of my time, and I know you'll hate this phrase, I'll have to leave it as an exercise for the reader for all of you to decide what the evolutionary hypothesis might signify for we moderns. I'll just add one more factor in the mix, a hint that should tie together what psychedelics may have done long ago and why they have not diminished either in power or potential to affect the history of humankind. Here is one of the most lucid and significant assessments of what psychedelic drugs might yet accomplish for us. In what admittedly were more hopeful times, Aldous Huxley wrote of psychedelics and modern man, with their aid, he should be able to adapt himself selectively to his culture, rejecting its evils, stupidities, and irrelevancies, gratefully accepting all its treasures of accumulated knowledge, of rationality, human heartedness, and practical wisdom. If the number of such individuals is sufficiently great, if their quality is sufficiently high, they may be able to pass from discriminating acceptance of their culture to discriminating change and reform. Thanks very much. Some still available to Gaius fans. They're sold out. I'll bring some more later. So a little later on if they're not there. Do you have a website that we can? Yes, I have a website. It's called the Psychedelic Rock.